Hey everybody, in today's video, I will be interviewing the CEO of DAG, AKA Constellation. Ben Jorgensen actually is one hell of a cool guy. And we actually get to talking about him personally, you know, where he came from, how he got to where he is today. And then of course we talk about the Constellation ecosystem. If you're liking the new channel, please like and subscribe. It would mean the world to me. Uh, you know, I get to stay home and research crypto and just interview amazing, interesting people and share that information with you. I hope the channel is helping you grow as an individual person. And if I can do anything to uh, make your day better, please let me know. If you want me to research something, just go ahead and comment on in the video. I check all comments. It would be really awesome if you did that. And uh, we also have some giveaways right now. We're going to give away some subscriptions for a year service in Kryptonaires. I'm going to give away $500 to two lucky winners this month. If you leave a comment, that'll get you registered. And we're still giving away 1 million Luna Classic. 500,000 to two people. Uh, that drawing should be wrapped up around the 15th, but you need to like, subscribe, and comment. Please help us grow this channel. It means the world to me. I hope you enjoy the video. Robert Doyle signing off. Take, take care, guys. Bye. So I'm Ben Jorgensen. I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of Constellation Network. Gosh, I'm from, you want me to go and in my background yeah from, please like, please man because charles I, dickens novel here i think we yeah. want to better understand who you are as a person i think that would be really good whatever you're willing to share with us man please and then we have some questions for you after you're done just enlightening us with the with your background and, and your experiences okay okay so yeah I, I think this is gonna be a lot of fun i actually have a lot of fun like when you make it a little personal yeah and then you kind of weave into a lot of the intention and around what you're building and then you can see the pieces unfold versus, man, I've listened to so many AMAs. I've actually been a part of AMAs where people are just so dry and you're like, this is the most boring <laughs> shit I've ever heard. Yep. And you're like zoning out and you're like doing something else. And you're like, wait, what did they say about Forex trading? You're like, God, who cares? It's fun to get personal. Tim Ferriss did an amazing job of creating a podcast around getting into the personal aspects and daily habits of successful people and whether you agree with tim ferris or not he does attract some really interesting people and the conversations are always pretty dynamic so let's do anyways, it anyways those are my let's do it so yeah i'm ben jorgens as i said i'm actually from indiana a medium-sized town called fort wayne and it's like living in the midwest you meet potatoes you don't think big you're it's a small town mentality of living in the midwest and I grew up with a family that encouraged my my craziness and creativity to always do amazing big things so i'm very fortunate to have a family that brought me up and in, into such a interesting upbringing we had a place in michigan that was a thousand acres and there were two 40 acre lakes on it Wow. And so we spent like our summer up there and it was one of the most beautiful, majestic areas of exploring the wilderness, understanding the foliage and learning about just nature and the dynamics. And I think it, it really gave credence to where I am today and what I do. I had so many people in Indiana that were like, you, you should be staying in Indiana. Like you have a good family, you, they have a good name. And that's the extent of what people thought. And I always wanted to move to California. And so California was where the future was invented, right? Yep. That's where culture is, style. There's so much. Silicon beautiful, Valley? Beautiful people. Yeah, Silicon Valley. It was a scary place for the Midwest. I still think it is. I still think it's, it was, it always gave me like fear because there's such smart people that are inventing the future and shaping the world like what a what an amazing place that this happened and by the way you can surf in the afternoon like what a cool <laughs> thing so yeah that's a brief introduction to me constellation on, from a high level we are an infrastructure tool that is addressing the blockchain tr trilemma of speed security and decentralization and we have an interesting approach that creates flexible developer tools that people can really design their application without having to conform to another programming language. So most layer one or layer zero protocols publish a framework that force developers to, to work within those guidelines. But with Constellation, you have complete flexibility. And this is really to mirror how existing Web2 or the existing applications in traditional internet are currently made 
so that we can create or add immutability and tokenization to really anything in the traditional internet world. And that's a really big vision yep. to be like, hey, we're completely flexible, which actually drives some of our people at the company insane on a daily basis. But it's, it's also uh, where we think the entire blockchain vision needs to head over the next five years. I completely agree with you. And we got some great consolation questions, but I really want to get back to you, Ben, because you you are a very interesting person and you're a dreamer from the Midwest and you moved out to California. I know you, uh, you made a, you you created a online video platform in 2008. Just talk to me about what was going through, what kind of led you to consolation? Let's talk a little bit about what you were doing before that. You've worked at Oracle. You've done so many interesting things. I'd really like to better understand where you came from as far as that goes. Yeah, no. Thanks. That's a great question. So some things I don't really tell people and I forget. In college, I did three majors in four years, anthropology, economics, political science, six honors thesis. Wow. And it like still, it wasn't like, it's putting all these like different experiences of life together to come up with this like general mission and thesis of life. And it like really inspired me because I like wanted business, but my belief in friends that were with economic so I'm like stupid. I think we might be losing you a bit, Ben. Oh, oh, shit. I think we lost you just Sorry. a little bit there. Do you want to... No, it's okay. Do you... Am I back? You're all good, man. Do you want to repeat maybe the last 30 seconds? You are. You're back and you're strong as hell. Maybe the last maybe 30 seconds just to catch back up. Yes. Okay. I think this should be better. If Can you hear me now? You're five by five right now. Five by five? Is that good? Yeah, that mean, yeah, that, yeah, five by five is good. If you're a one out of five, that'd be pretty bad. Sorry, you're coming in very five strong. Out of five. Sorry, my bad. Five by five. Yeah, yeah my no, bad. No, no, no worries. I'm, if it gets a little windy, I'm just like you're sitting out outside having the conversation. No, I'm not out surfing, but I am sitting outside to get to get some sun out of sitting in front of a computer. Yeah, I think so. As I was saying, I did three honor or three majors in four years and six honors thesis, and really it was like to get an idea of how you synthesize different lines of thinking to create a different perspective of life. Going through an anthropology major forms your perspective entirely, and then when you add some traditional majors like political science and and economics. So you kind of weave a very fascinating narrative. But my first entrepreneurial thing was in, one of my first entrepreneurial things was in college. And I started a magazine called American Political Rationality that that was based on Michel Foucault, a postmodern philosopher, wrote about power structures. And I was really fascinating about how power structures evolve with new inventions and perspectives in society. And so I wrote this, I created this magazine that was supposed to be like very objective and no money and no advertising. And you bring students and teachers together to write, which was so cool. Like the articles that came out was amazing. That fell uh, face flat when nobody, when I had this dream that somebody would buy it and really support it and nobody bought it, but the, nobody bought it. And I was like, so what's your business model? I was like, fuck the business model. Okay, well, that didn't, didn't really work well, but the conversations were really cool and yeah. I'm like really proud of it. Even to this day, there was some really interesting satire that was written in there as well. That, that then I went into doing on learning how to sell a computer software. So I worked for a high-end web development company and sold high-end web development projects. And then I did project management for that, like right out of college, where I had an offer to go work in investment banking. And I didn't like the politics around getting the job. So I was like, fuck that. I, I want to do something cool. And so I, that's actually, I think in some ways it saved me and brought me into this computer world where I learned how to PM a project. So then I started my own online video platform in 2008 called it was called like oso.tv and unfortunately we don't have the i wish i had a lot of the backlinks to all of that stuff that we did but we'd go out and my whole vision was like content's going to go online in in 2008 2007 and it's not going to be 30 second cat videos that's where youtube was <laughs> uh, like that's literally what youtube was it was like oh my god people are posting cat videos playing pianos which is pretty tight but uh, so i had this like whole vision around creating this like curated content online longer form content and so we had like our own news segment we had cooking shows we had out and about like in the club interviews with athletes and 
then that's how I learned about internet advertising. I was like, how the fuck do you monetize it? It was so expensive to pay for streaming video at the time. And I didn't know how to raise money. I didn't even know that was like a thing. I just thought I'm Midwest. I was like, you got to make money, right? Like it's got to make money. There's no thing, such thing as like investing in this. And so I started to learn about internet advertising. So then it, I learned really fast on how to monetize this stuff. And then I was charging people for these videos as well and sponsorship. And so it did all right for two years. And I moved to LA and I had, I was like, okay, I'm gonna take all this, these actors that are doing like, they do like pilot reels or like clips to like audition. And some of the stuff was like really good. Okay, so like co cooking shows that they would give to a producer to be like, hey, we wanna, we wanna air this cooking show, buy it. And, and so there's a lot of that in LA. And I just started gobbling up content. And they're like, why do you want this content? I was like, dude, if we show you that we can get a lot of impressions, you can take that to a producer and show that you have a following. And they're like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. But whatever you want, you can take the content. So I got all this free content. So I wasn't paying for it anymore, the curation. And I just started arbitraging internet advertising on it against video ads because there weren't many of us still in the space. And then you had YouTube, I think, exited and sold to Google. And so there was like this little community in LA that that was doing this video thing. And it was a extreme learning, extremely amazing learning process for me. I learned a ton about entrepreneurship. I was a shitty CEO, uh, if you even want to call it that. I was I like, I was like 25, 24, 25. And I was just a dictator. I was awful. I'm sure somebody <laughs> in the com company's listening right now. He still is. But it was like, so on, like, I could tell you the people I sat down, like famous producers and money backers of LA would meet with me. And they said, the internet's a fad. One, I had, I got the internet's a fad. There's no money in it. And I then got another response that was, I wish I could tell you who, I want to tell you who it is because it'll make everybody die. But the internet's a fad. And I said, you created one of the first internet TV series on AOL. And they're like, oh yeah, well, I don't care where it goes. I sold the advertising. And I was like, oh, and he's like, I made $30 million off of. I think we're losing him. I think we might've lost him just a bit there. He's probably just got Sorry a about that. Benny there. Oh, you're good. You're good, man. Yeah. I got a phone call. No, that, that was an incredible story. So long story short. Sorry, I'm, I'm like rambling, but you're good, man. This is good. I don't think I've ever heard. I've listened to so many of your interviews. and I don't think you've ever gotten this deep into kind of your background. So it's very, it's interesting to hear. Yes. Sorry. Hold on. I'm getting like a phone call and I don't know how to like stop it from coming through. But to do this, okay. anyways, so yeah, I had this meeting and they said the internet's only going to be used for like 30 second videos. I was like, no way, this is going to be curated content. And so I ended up meeting this girl and I went on a road trip to San Francisco and I went out and I met this girl that's, you're really smart. You need to drop your entrepreneurial endeavor. You don't know how to raise money and I need to get you a job with like a tier one entrepreneur that's just crushing it. And so I licked my wounds and shut down the business. And then I got my, I said, okay, I can do the San Francisco thing. And that brought me into the fold of San Francisco. So sorry for the long story, but. No, that's a great story. And so that's where you went to Oracle and you met the other Ben. No, the, and the uh, other Diggles you know, went to Oracle. Funny enough. Got so, it. And that was like years later. But the story with Diggles and I is actually pretty comic on how we met and how we engaged. We got engaged. God, he is like my, he's like my work wife. He totally <laughs> is. But Diggles, Benjamin Diggles worked at Oracle. I did not. However, Diggles did try to get me a job at Oracle and I inter That's yeah, what it was. I interviewed nine with nine different global vice presidents at Oracle that wanted to hire me. And during the nine months of being interviewed, they each one of them got slowly like fired and then a new person came in. And oh, then no. and like the way that we all came about was I was like, Diggles, I need you to come on board this thing called Constellation. I think it's gonna be something. And he's like, I was just trying to get you a job. And I was like, yeah, now I can hire you. <laughs> I can pay you what you want, man. Come yeah. with me. Yeah. So how did you get into blockchain and crypto? Well, I know you got Wyatt, but there's the other Ben. Tiff, you guys just all came together and decided to create something truly just mind blowing and incredible. Can you just tell us maybe quickly about how that all came together? Yeah, really quickly. So I, let's see, after my second startup, I went and did I met this author of a New York Times bestseller called Exponential Organizations. 
And if you haven't read this book, it's, it's amazing. I, I call it like corporate crack because corporate leadership would read this book, which really talks about how in, innovation is stifled at Fortune 500 companies because they have an immune system reaction to innovation. Innovation is the antithesis of corporate culture, but yet corporations are getting clobbered by the startup ecosystem, just taking bites out at them and even surpassing them at certain levels. And so I met this author and he's, hey, I want to turn my book into a, like a consulting business and sell these like sprints to corporate leadership to identify new innovative startups and how we adopt it, purchase it or build it. And, uh, and so I, held, I was the chief revenue officer for the company. And one of those technologies that we would go and tell like anywhere from TD Ameritrade to Black & Decker, all these like well-known brands that we would teach them about blockchain and crypto and VR and crowdsourcing, all this kind of like these buzzwords that are still like relevant. It's, it's so crazy to hear how corporate leadership talks and like how CMOs at that level talk. Cause they're like, what is this VR stuff? And, and so I'm not a consultant. I didn't work at McKinsey and our partner was Accenture that was helping us sell through. And I really just, I didn't really get the culture. I'm a builder. I love building stuff. And it's funny, I put that intention out in the space. Like I didn't feel like I fit in. We did really the first couple of years, our first year in doing that. I think I was only with them for a year. And during that time, somebody in San Francisco introduced me to Wyatt and introduced me to Wyatt. It was like, hey, I want you to invest in us. You've built this name in San Francisco. Just please sit down with me. And I didn't want to sit down with that individual, but I was like, okay, I'll just meet with this guy. And so I met with Wyatt and Wyatt, he sat there and told me about how Ethereum is broken mm -hmm. and how it's just like a joke for any sort of real world developer, how it's isolated in development, it forces you into solidity coding. And, and you're just like, I, when you hear why, if you've ever heard Wyatt talk, like he, he can blow your mind when you get him into a, when you get him into a cadence of talking, he will blow your mind on how he talks about the world. And you might not understand it all, but you understand his passion and intention and that's like something that I look at when I look at like entrepreneurs, it's like, where's your passion? And can you get into a flow state when you talk about it? Can I get you to a flow state to talk about it? I don't need to be proven that you're going to be a billion dollar company. I need you to prove to me that you're passionate about it. And you know that like, you're going to do anything to research this. And so Wyatt, I looked at him and he's, I was like, what's the business? He's like, oh, it's this thing called Rakugo. And it like basically credits people for contributing content. And I looked at him and I said, so you just told me about how Ethereum is broken and yet you're doing this like publishing platform off like a iteration of, what is it, Steam it? And he's, yeah. And I was like, yeah, I'm not interested. But if you go back to the drawing board <laughs> and write about what you just blew my mind on and you write that out, then let's go shop this around. And he came back to me. And so they were in this like iterative Altif and the former CEO of Constellation was, that was with us for a few months and Wyatt were putting together Rakugo still. And I said, you guys really get this, <laughs> like still doing it. And they like, I was like, hey, you guys really should do, take a lesson from the startup, Lean Startup, really good book yeah. as well. And I said, take a cue from that and teach people how to do this ICO and charge people for a one day event. and just don't worry about the money to see what the following comes up. And I think they had, so I went away for vacation and they came back and they're like, Hey Ben, we did what you said. We had 50 people show up. They paid, I don't know, like 20 bucks. I don't, I forget what it was. And we did this little mini ICO uh, and we raised like a hundred grand and we distributed it all back. And I was like, why? And they're like, Cause you're right. It's too small of an idea, but yet, and I said, see, now you're getting validation to what your strength is. And so they went back to the drawing board, came out with the white paper. And I was like, Wyatt, I'm fucking on board. And, but I, we need to tell your story differently. Nobody's going to understand this pitch deck. And Wyatt and I spent countless hours between like October and I think Jan January of 2017 into 2018 and he has put money in. I brought in some money from friends 
and I put money in and I was like, this thing's pretty cool. So we had a little bit of seed funding. It was cool. We had 500 grand. And, and then all of a sudden <laughs> it was my birthday in January, tw- tw- January 20th is my birthday. I remember being on my birthday trip in new Orleans and my email just started getting flooded. And I was like, guys, what's going on right now? Is this like s- spam? Like people are offering millions of dollars to come into this. And I was like, Oh my God, Holy shit. This is the virality that we always, you always talk about. And, and so I spent my birthday like re- answering phone calls, answering, answering, emails. answering emails and phone, <laughs> like jumping on a phone call. I had the pitch down and I was just raising money. And Matthias was in Switzerland. I was like, I'm coming to see you. There's something going on. And before I know it, I was like back in LA bringing in. And that's, that was like the start of this whole thing. And that was like, when I was like, Diggles, I, I think it was like at a million bucks, we raised money. I was like, we have so much money. Come on in. And it like ended up like snowballing. It was pretty, a pretty wild few months that you just don't, you don't turn your head. You don't question anything. You just keep moving forward. And that was like, yeah. that's, that's, cool. that's incredible, man. And uh, you know what? I want to get into some consolation questions if you have the yeah. time, but I did want to ask you maybe one or two more personal questions. You seem like you, you're a spiritual person. Can you talk us through who, who you look up to or what you follow in your day to day? How do you be Ben Jorgensen? I guess I just like to little, know a little bit more about that. Yeah, that's a cool, that's a cool question. Yeah. Yeah. We're all very spiritual at the company. And I like to say that the spirituality of this whole thing runs it. And it runs us like sometimes I don't even feel at the helm and you really need to teach yourself a lot about abundance and scarcity and go through a lot mm-hmm. of, a lot of personal work, um, which is essential in, in to what I'm doing today and to navigate a lot of negativity that comes from either a community or from the general world. That's I don't understand what you're doing. I'm like, that seems like your scarcity mindset. I got really, it's hard to describe, but I think there's been a lot of, I think that goes back to like how I grew up and why I wanted to talk, say a little bit about the Indiana and the property in Michigan was, it was very spiritual for me, right? Like understanding nature, like feeling nature, being like at one with it, not knowing what that is. I did a lot of reading as a kid, but self-work, personal work became like a big backbone to me. I felt misunderstood in college. I read a lot in college. I didn't really fit in. I was like the vice president of the Greek system at University of Arizona. Like I wanted to put, I quit one day because it just, it, it wasn't me at the core and I didn't like the culture. I didn't like the domestication that came out of fraternities and it was like forced friendship and just so much of it was like the antithesis of who I was as a human, but I was still in that like personal discovery stage. So now today I do a lot of meditation. I don't do as much as I, I used to do it like every day as a, like a religious thing, yeah. not religious in that kind of dogmatic but sense. Y- yeah you had a schedule set up where you'd spend spend an hour or two or whatever it was a yeah, day focusing for on that. sure and acu- absolutely acupuncture and i was like in this yep. like, moment of meditating so much that i was like i'm preparing my body for some like massive shift and then constellation came in so now i do like twice a week i meditate really meditating on gratitude and abundance i go to three different therapists i go to somebody that that has more compassion on kind of the day-to-day nuances somebody that helps out with uh, spirituality and identifying how to tap into your intuition more fluently and then the third one really providing tools that break down how do you say she provides me with tools on managing how we emote in this world and doing like past life regressions where why do we have certain emotions that come up at certain times and so all these kind of things help put together the complexity of of really the world that i operate in constellation but also help, help me operate as an individual. I work out religiously. I do really hardcore Pilates, boxing, and circuit training. And then like I treat Constellation like, like, uh, like an athletic, like a professional ath- athletic team that I'm like constantly fueling my body with celery juice in the morning, not eating too many carbohydrates, limiting gluten intake, limiting the amount I eat. And then on the weekends, man, that, as Diggles would say, Ben, it's your cheat day. Uh, <laughs> on the weekends, I treat it like Driggles would say, Ben, you treat your body like a state fair on the weekends. <laughs> and, uh, and you got to let loose to have a little bit of fun. If anybody's been around me, they know I, I sure like to have a cocktail and I love good champagne. Yeah. So that's like 
you get into the nuances and spirituality, I think it's important to have that balance while trying not to take yourself too seriously. Although if you've met me, I take everything really seriously and try to make it fun. But yeah, it's, it's always reading. It's uh, reading's kind of, if you're not reading, like, I don't, it's hard for me to relate to people, but yeah. No, that was actually my last question about you personally is I know you've, you've, you mentioned exceptional organizations and then you mentioned Lean Startup. Is there any other book you think would be of value to younger people coming up that want to follow in your footsteps, right? Help build the next evolution of what the world's going to look like in five years. Web3, what other, anything else that you could recommend for someone like myself or anyone else listening? Yeah, God, God I had an ex-girlfriend that would crush through a business book a week. And she, to this day, is one of my most inspirational entrepreneurs. She was a really amazing individual. And uh, God, she, we would just go through books. And we did it with a good friend of mine, Tony Shea, who is one of the founders of Zappos and became CEO of Zappos. And he died a couple of years ago, tragically. But so we had this like little, I'm sorry to hear yeah, that. We had this book club. It was like reading, God, I'm going to botch this, but Ray Dalio writing, I think it's called Principles by Ray Dalio, the founder of the hedge fund Bridgewater, whether you agree with his politics or not, it's a fascinating culture that they've built there. Thinking in systems was really a monumental book that I think like more of a product person and then how dependencies work. Uh, and ultimately, it really ha- plays a huge role in how I look at Constellation and working with product, marketing, input, output. And it's a book that's really under a lot of people's radar, but Tony Shea slid that one across. But I quit my San Francisco job and went back to being an entrepreneur when I read Tony Shea's book, Delivering Happiness. And that was like, that book to me was about how to build a company culture and how this was essential because it ultimately meant an amazing end product to the consumer. And they always joke like Zappos isn't a shoe company. It's a company that delivers happiness. Customer service, yeah. Yeah, customer service, thank you. And when I quit my job, I wrote like Tony Shea on LinkedIn because he answers his LinkedIn, right? And I'm like, Tony, and I, I remember quitting, the day I quit that job, I was like, this company culture sucks. And the CEO went, Ben, I think you should be your own entrepreneur. I was like, I am, and you should read this book because this is a real company. And then two years later, I found myself in Tony Shea's orbit in his like amazing vision of downtown Vegas. And anyways, I digress. Delivering happiness really helped shape me. There's so many books. There's some esoteric books that I don't want to tell people because it is actually so spiritual that it's almost weird, but it's how to like navigate negative energy and create a force field around you like it gets into crazy stuff like that to like business books that i think absolutely incredible thinking in systems lean startup scaling up um man i mean there's just i'll have to think about that and just send you're gonna have to write a list of yeah send a list of the book club i'd love to get into it we still got a little bit of time right can we ask you some questions now about constellation because i'm sure there's people in the audience like just gearing for it right now you know what i wanted to do too will garu here he's been my co-pilot he's actually the one who helped set this up he's been talking to lt behind the scenes i know he had a couple questions that he wanted to get out of the way for constellation so let me go ahead and turn it over to will to ask a couple questions and then i'll go ahead and end it with a couple of mine okay yeah, I, I love it. I have I had this slated in my calendar for an hour. So whoever scheduled oh, you're this, a beautiful like, man. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so whoever scheduled beautiful. it was like giving everybody a little bit of. So I'm happy to go into Constellation. And I think a lot of people know that when I talk Constellation, I normally share alpha that I'm not supposed yeah. to, and the company cringes. But we won't to twist your arm too hard. No, okay, no, we won't no. twist your arm, and we'll keep it light too. So go ahead. Why don't you go ahead and ask your first question? Yeah, it's a pleasure, Ben, and thank you for being here with us here. So my first question is: so we always hear about the gasless fees with Constellation. Are still here? No? Yeah. Ben, uh, can, can you hear, you hear me? him? Will no. talks a little quiet. I do not hear anything. Oh, Will, try to speak up real quick. Yeah. Hello. 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 Can you hear him at all, Ben? No. Can anybody okay. else hear him? Um, yeah. Hey, go, Will, go ahead, Rob. Let's you, continue. Yeah. Okay. So here, let's, let, I'll get into the questions. Maybe he can disconnect and come back, but... <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about uh, Constellation. You guys talk a lot of it. Uh, besides gasless fees, right? What other important yeah. features about Constellation do you wish the uh, do you wish the community to understand the importance of? What else besides the gasless fees? Like, what else is important about Constellation? 
Yeah, I would say I would go back to what I said in the earlier day or earlier in this conversation, which is the flexibility. So when we launched developer documentation like a month ago and the tooling that's coming out over the next six months are really to let developers imagine sort of any application that they could tie into with the hypergraph. And that's the hard part about that is that, like I said, a lot of other ecosystems, Cardano, Cosmos, Solana, they really force you into a framework and you have to work with that, which is very smart by design, right? It's okay. Hey, we don't want you to, you don't want to deal with the blank page (laughs) dilemma where you don't know what to do in the very beginning, but at the same time, not many people want to be forced into some certain framework. And so our design choice was really to provide this complete flexibility. Imagine any sort of application and be able to structure any sort of data type or schema and validate that on a blockchain. And why that's important is because if you think about the way that Web2 works is you have data engineers, application developers that are collecting data, right? They're building applications in a microservice architect architecture that allows complete flexibility to communicate with other dependencies and applications, right? Yep. Uh, and so a lot uh, blockchain doesn't allow you to interoperate between other dependencies. And so it really constricts what the developer can actually do and forces them into one ecosystem or one coding language or one blockchain, right? But that's not how Web2 works. And so even Vitalik said, uh, or Vitalik said, yeah, whatever. Uh, whoever that guy is. Yeah, that, that the guy that runs guy. Ethereum. Yeah, yeah he's really skinny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That guy, yeah, yeah. yeah, he does governance proposals now. But he even said multi-layer scheming solutions built on top of each other just don't typically work. And I'm like, did he really just say that? Yeah, that's what we've been trying to say all along at Constellation. This doesn't work outside the world. Why doesn't it work? Because somebody that's building an application that has complete flexibility to find a data type, store that data, be able to call that data and pull that data works in a way that works with centralized databases, servers, all the architecture that's been laid out over the past 30 years. And then blockchain comes in and says, yeah, you just have to use this little piece just and you can only build your app on this little ecosystem let's that doesn't scale yes so i'm really tapping into scalability through flexibility right and so when we came along we're like okay we want all of our developer tools to look just like you would do when you build a microservice application in web 2 right or traditional internet however you want to use that buzzword i'm trying to use different buzzwords because i still don't think this whole world gets what we're doing and yet it's right in front of everybody it's like everything you interact with right now is a microservice framework the things that you work with in blockchain are not and they do not connect easily with each other and if they do at all it's through multi-layer technology schema yeah. layer one two and three So what Constellation is doing is saying, get rid of the layer two, three. Those are band-aids. They're Frankenstein solutions. They're built on top of each other. You can create dependencies with databases or applications and connect it with the features and tenants of blockchain, immutability, auditability, validation. And you can come to Constellation to define that data type so it looks like what you're doing in other sandbox and dev environments. That to me is like the thing that I'm going to regurgitate for the next year that's going to make people pop. Because it's feeless, that makes it easy for that developer to have more flexibility in their application design. You don't have to start thinking about the economics of if you build on this chain, you can actually build it in the same way that you do existing web architecture. And then you can add your own fees to a certain subset of your business or application. So the onus really comes onto the application, but also the flexibility to define that financial model, that gas fee at the core of it. And so while we are feeless, we do for people that need more bandwidth, use cases that require instant settlement and immutability and have a lot of data coming through and need large amounts of bandwidth, there are fee structures built into that for those use cases. But when we're talking peer-to-peer transactions, like we said, why that should be free. You should be able to send your money where you want and not have to deal with a gas. Think yep. about that from an application layer. 
like how do you sell that through to people be like hey we have really cool technology but today it might be five dollars to use it and the next day it might be 300 yeah like, what yeah. and then transactions will fail and you lose that 300 <laughs> congratulations yeah ex exactly like you can't have that type of model to connect to existing web to internet technology which that's not going away like we can't sit here and think that web 3 is solving everything there it's about the interoperability between both systems and being able to use different pieces yeah, for different uses yeah you do have a lot of siloed businesses web3 is trying to help unsilo those things by building out different applications let's talk a little bit about you describe your vision for the on-chain governance and how that's different in the constellations core team yeah no so this is something that we've been really planning behind the scenes and is being spearheaded by a couple people at the company matthias mm -hmm. goldman and Mike Butcher, which really pulls on to a lot of DeFi governance and is very, and it's pulling on Ethereum's EIP. It's pulling on the BIP for Bitcoin and it's, and then it's pulling in application layer DAOs, right? Uh, and I think that's important to distinguish that governance is this ominous term. We're back to ominous terms in crypto, God forbid, but we need more ominous terms like governance. Application layer one governance is very different than protocol layer governance, our infrastructure. So where we're trying to gravitate, where we're starting to merge is lending different systems. Tezos is doing some really interesting things with delegates. BIP was interesting, EIP and the Ethereum magicians, really fascinating stuff that we're trying to put like this kind of evolution of governance together that brings in node operators as well as the entire community and even people that aren't necessarily DAG holders. Uh, and so our first experimentation and kind of a very 101 level is LTX or our Lattice.is, Lattice Gateway and the VE LTX vote escrow token that will start to educate our community and user base on how to submit proposals, the benefits of proposals, how we share, how Constellation Inc. shares rewards with people, which we're getting ready to do in the next couple of weeks. Starting to show people those mechanics through the VELTX, through Ethereum's technology. And while governance with DAG has to be way more thought out, this is something that we've been doing for a while. So this is coming, like we want to push this out rather quickly, especially with mainnet 2.0. We're really exploring things like using an L0 token that is non-transferable and acts as a governance token and including that in our whole layout, which is the presentation that, that we've seen internally has been nothing short of one of the most amazing and evolutionary pieces to the, this whole governance playbook. And like I said, without giving me too, I'm, I know I'm going back and forth, but without saying too much, it's like a combination of different things, right? Application yeah. DAOs to infrastructure protocol layers where you have improvement proposals and activating the community and the way that we see governance we want our community to really partake in the governance as marketing or showcasing our ecosystem in a way that hasn't been done in other crypto projects. Uh, and I think we have the base of the community there to really get involved and see the benefits, see rewards in a different way uh, from Constellation. That's yeah. incredible, man. Will, can you actually, do you want to try to ask a question? Yeah, can, I'm back. I'm back. Can, can you, you hear him, Ben? Uh, I can, I can. Yay. Yay. Pleasure, Yay. pleasure Yay. to meet you, brother. Hey, nice to meet good, you. Good. So, Solid question. I'm going to follow the big 2.0 mainnet launch here. Any metrics that you care to share with the community that you can <sighs> see? Man, look, the validator rewards are growing. Our validator nodes are growing. This has been our first launch and starting to open up the network, which is on the roadmap and is an essential piece for us to open up the entire network for more node operators. This launching of mainnet 2.0 was a new challenge for us to orchestrate a uh, large amount. I think there's somewhere in the reign, reign of 300 nodes that are being onboarded, getting them to actually go through somewhat of a technical process of deploying a node. And so that's taken time behind the scenes. So what I call when I did the hypergraph hour a couple of weeks ago or whatever, I said, this is the let it breathe moment where we're like tweaking, modifying, making sure the node operators are onboarding, perfecting that flow so that we can get feel more confident about opening up the entire network so I, I don't have a ton of metrics so to speak although 
I got to give a huge shout out to the protocol team and so many people on the other side of the engineering team, as, as well as NetMet that have been able to really orchestrate all of these players. Like you're dealing with a lot of people across the globe and trying to get them to get on online, right? Like it's a complicated process. It's not just, hey, deploy this script and get up and going. There's a lot of nuances that go into this. And it's been it's pretty been pretty eye-opening to see how see the technical innovation that's spun out of the protocol team's time to make this suit make this easier than it's ever been. And yet go, okay, how do we get this even better for opening up the network? So the takeaway for me is that it's been completely painless on the launch. I'm sure some people are like, oh my God, but launching it was, <laughs> there was no, there was no real downtime beyond just the network restart. There's been no complications. It's been awesome to see it handled and see it perfected that kind of onboarding experience. So we're still in that let it breathe onboarding experience. Talk to me in a couple of months and I think I'll have a little better answer. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. And then I kind of want to get back to you now, away from Constellation. So now with 2.0, what are you most proud of about yourself and what did you uh, struggle with? I, what I'm most proud of is, okay, this is so cool. I got to tell this story. We were on this call, like 13, 13 of us were on this call yesterday and we've got this like stealth project behind the scenes that I can't tell anybody about. And it's, it's one of these amazing w pieces of wizardry that's happening. And it's this product that we built that I, ah, it's hard to explain, but it plays into the social dynamics of crypto and communication. And we're on the, like 13 of us were on this call with this third party vendor and all of us were testing it and testing this new product that kind of related to the third party vendor. And it was seamless. It was awesome. And our whole team was just like, having so much fun behind the scenes that it was just it, what happened to me there was seeing how connected and fluid the entire company is right now. We started shifting kind of roles and responsibilities across the board. It's funny how like the community is like, oh, what's this person's title? The one thing at Constellation is we have like optic titles for everybody. But behind the scenes, the way we structure things is vastly different. We don't communicate this because nobody will understand. And then they'll start creating FUD. And what does this mean? And it's everybody's so motivated and having so much fun and building things faster than we've ever dreamed of. And we're being so innovative. My goal over the last three months ago is I need everybody to be more agile and innovative. And so people started becoming executive sponsors over different business lines and bi different business units while being able to pull on different resources in the company and figuring out how to create buy-in, right? Kind of this governance model that we're perfecting internally of how do you get buy-in from different people in different departments, but bring in their expertise. And so what I've started to see is like by individuals being an executive sponsor over a rather large in initiative that takes in multiple stakeholders across the company, people have a new sense of ownership over the products that are deployed. How do you market it? How do you perfect the usability of it? How do you get technical resources and convince technical resources to come in or marketing resources? So to me, like the most exciting thing is like seeing rapid innovation happen at, at Constellation since Mainnet 2.0, since Lattice 2.0. And so I'm really excited about what's coming in because everybody's thinking state channels. How do we spin out multiple state channels for this? How does this work? How does this create a currency sync on DAG? How does it create a throttle for LTX? What projects are coming? Like it's so fast and iterative and everybody's having a really good time versus the Silicon Valley model where it's, dude, just stick somebody in a BD position and have them tell them these are the terms. And if they say no, okay, move on. Or here's your engineering task. Do this one task. Like it doesn't incite creativity. It doesn't inspire loyalty in the company. And this model is something new that is actually inspiring a lot of lo loyalty and creative thinking and breathing room. So I'm excited about state channel development. I'm excited about this token standard that we're creating behind the scenes around, we call it like social capital. It's pretty cool. I think it's cool. I'm going to have so much fun with it. It's around non-transferable tokens and like creating new use cases, creating more social in our ecosystem. Hardware is a big one for us. Seeing the hardware come in uh, for the door, door traffic miner, getting ready to ship that product see this kind of vision come to light 
We've got new data exchanges coming in that want to buy our data. So we're building out that network of, of data exchanges where those rewards through selling of data will go back to node operators, DTM, miners. And we're starting to create even more hardware behind the scenes that is like some of the coolest shit I've seen. And I'm like, I wish I could tell everybody and just let everybody just see what's going on. But it would like spoil the fun and like the market. And I've already given the like, excitement. I, yeah, I've already given so much alpha into this one. If you if this one conversation that and like and doing this reg CF, we have this reg CF coming out, which is a crowdfunding initiative that we're doing. We're getting ready to announce it uh, where we're opening it up. So reg CF allows a company to raise up to five million to non-accredited and accredited investors. So. We basically do a filing with the SEC and we sell equity into Constellation. And so it's been interesting bringing the different teams together because we see this as really exciting where a lot of these other protocols went venture first and the venture capitalists all got their first dibs on tons of tokens, tons of governance rights. We were like, okay, we understand the need to be well capitalized. We want to attract developer talent, but let's start out with the community first. Let's get our community to get a stake in Constellation, a true equity stake where they buy in to the revenue side of the business, not necessarily the token side. And what I like about this model is it's separating the identity of what DAG is and what LTX is as a cryptocurrency and separating that from the equity and shares of Constellation. So that's going to be coming out in the next couple of weeks. And I think it's an amazing vision that I don't think any, I don't think another protocol or infrastructure layer has actually done a crowdfunding initiative like this. And the whole goal is to build more adoption, to build awareness of Constellation, right? That's the primary goal and give people the ability to say, hey, I own a share in Constellation. Print that shit out. Put it up on your door. I you know, like, <laughs> Put cool. it on my wall. Yeah, it's not just the crypto. Yeah, put it on your wall. Like, how do you get involved in a company like this and see that and then help us build out developer incentives to really expand our ecosystem? I know I just said a ton of shit, but that's yeah, the shit that goes you. through my, yeah, my That goes through my mind. This is the extent of everything that goes through my mind on a daily basis. It's, I wish I could be one of the people that has an executive sponsor over one thing at the company, but instead I'm overseeing, making sure all these things fluidly connect. So. Yeah, if you have, we're going to have our own, we have our own hardware division at Constellation. It's amazing to see how this comes together and, and all these pieces and how the hardware is going to be connecting to the hypergraph and more data coming on. It's some cool shit. It's really exciting. Ben, ben let me ask you really quickly, because the Constellation ecosystem is by far one of the most exciting ecosystems in, in crypto. If you've been in my community, you know, they are probably tired of me talking about it. You really? have like Jenny Co. Yeah, I talk about DAG way too much. He in does. Community. Je does. Jenny Co, Obius, BioFi, Alchemy, Lattice. How, when you guys are really ready to onboard all of these truly incredible projects, is it going to take a very long time or is it something that you guys you flip a switch and then everything's onboarded in a week? Walk me through once we get to the point where you guys are ready to go. How long is it going to take to get all these incredible projects going? Man, a couple of weeks ago, I tried to lay out for the community what a roadmap looks like. Much Think of it like onboarding node operators, right? Like you're going to have different skill sets, technical skill sets that they're able to spin up a node rather quickly. They're able to open up a terminal, run a script, connect all the stuff that needs connected. And then you're going to have people that don't know anything about it. So you have this yeah. range of people that we had to batch out. The same thing is for the technology side. On the technology side, we have people like Alchemy and GeoJam and Double oh, yeah, Dice. Geo and, yeah, GeoJam. Just syncs with those guys. Like you have got it. You got Jenny Co, all of which have like yep. real technical chops that can actually design a state channel with very little support. And so those are kind of like our early people that we want to like get out and running because they can really establish the framework on which to develop and how to do this. They can also establish their own standards, right? These are really complicated tasks that not everybody's ready for, right? A lot of, some developers want it fully baked and sent to them. And tell me when it's fully baked. Over the next like year, you're going to see different pieces, features, functionalities that just make it easier for developers, right? So mainnet 2.0 is really about the launch of allowing people to connect, but then identifying the kind of where people are on their technical readiness or adoption curve. In marketing, you have like early stage adopters to late stage and it's a bell-shaped curve and we, we don't need to go into that. But so same with developers, right? It's the same thing. Yep. And so 
And then you have different use cases, right? GeoGM needs like an L0 token. They need a transferable L0 token. Then you've got governance that needs a non-transferable token. You've got NFT marketplaces spinning up and they want to design their own NFT standard, like another group, The Void, like doing some really heavy lifting on the technical oh, yeah. side to be the example and set the standard that people will use their standard to de design NFTs on Constellation. So it's not even just building this application layer, it's building, it's using community to design the standards where our protocol team starts to integrate and make it just easier and easier. So it's supposed to get easier and easier. And guess what? You don't have to worry about the gas fees in the interim, right? These <laughs> things that you don't have to worry about, just worry yeah. about the technical problem, not the gas fees. The gas fees will come with the applications when they start to design the usability and the utility of their token or their application. Um, and so all these things are happening. Like, I know you're looking for like an absolute date. Like, oh, no, over the... I wasn't going to ask you for a date, but I know crypto gets complicated. I would never ask you for a date because it's hard, right, to keep that date because things happen. There's so much that you're building. So I, I would never ask you for a date. But let me ask you this, Ben. Being an American company, right, here in America, and I talk to my community about this all the time, are, is Constellation working with lobbyists and the government to, to hopefully get crypto regulation right in the United States? Are you guys doing anything to help push that narrative forward? Yeah, I think there's a, I'll say, of course, we're working with the, the government, a lot well, of different we, yeah. agents. Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah, we got you. Oh, a lot of different agencies. I wouldn't say that we're working with lo lobbyists. We're not writing like legislation and stuff like that. But I will say the fastest way to adoption or better understanding of what the technology is or clarity is by getting people to actually use it at, in a yep. meaningful way that's not crypto and the tokenization. So even with working with the DOD and their use case has massive impact, right? That oh, in yeah. involuntarily becomes our lobbyist, right? We have 13 letters of recommendation from different people in the government that are like, hey, this is a really essential piece, right? We These need this. That's yeah, we saying. need this. This isn't like a nice to have, yeah. right? Like the, yeah. the, I can go into stories about all of that, but this isn't a nice to have. It's like, you're now like getting people to see, oh, let's not regulate this shit because we don't understand it. Let's like use it. And if yep. we see something shady, then maybe we shut it down. But they're actually identifying massive use cases. Like the DOD use case is so on the spectrum of complexity, like the very complex side of things. Like we hit the threshold of, the most complex use case that can be used for Constellation, while DAG is the simplest state channel and use case on Constellation. So everything in between is is like, all right, let's just line it up and start going. Trust me, like it's, we want to get it out there. So we are working with people and in government subcontractors uh, or primes, they call them. And these people shuttle in new technology, their system integrators that sell through the technology, through relationships, things that a five-year com five-year-old company doesn't have, but we're creating those partners and inroads that are allowing us to get really evangelized across the board a lot faster than just doing it all ourselves. If you look at Palantir as, a, as this like company, IPO company a few years ago, they all deal with like data solutions. Like 80% yep. of their business is the government. And it took them 15 years to IPO and really sell through a vision. It took that a while. Like we're like, fuck that. We don't want to deal with that. We're throwing <laughs> the subcontracts are, so doing the government angle is one angle while yeah. focusing on retail and the crypto side becomes a more direct path as well. So we're doing a lot of things in parallel. It's pretty fascinating to see how they can all come together. Incredible, man. And instead of me asking a final question, is there anything that, you know, you would like to talk about or bring up before we end today? Anything important to you that you'd like to get out? Man, I feel like I've said a lot of shit today. You covered you, you, a lot. It's a fantastic last hour, man. Yeah. I really appreciate the time. Did you want to maybe hint on the flight program? I know there's a lot of just truly incredible projects coming out of the flight program. I was at high def with you guys and we watched, what was it? Obius was the first, it scored 100 out of 100. You guys have some truly incredible projects being built out right now. Did you just want to talk a little bit about the flight program at all? Yeah, I'm the flight pro. So we've done two cohorts where people go through an incubation process. Yep. They learn about how to launch a cryptocurrency. We're actually getting ready to refine that program. There's a lot of the things preventing people from minting their own cryptocurrencies around legal frameworks. So we've partnered up with Ashbury Legal to create kind of a 
DIY or do-it-yourself package while having advisory behind the scenes to shuttle people through. I think that's an amazing, amazing thing that I think is going to help people filter through if they're equipped to go through the flight program. And so we're getting to the, we're designing the next flight program where we want people to actually build the L0 tokens, new use cases, state channels. So it's going to require a little more knowledge, a little more buy-in from individuals. And, and thus, like, I I think it's going to curate an amazing group uh, of entrepreneurs. It'll probably be a smaller group because we're going to let other people just build without going through the incubation program, but this will give people firsthand knowledge on how to build a cryptocurrency, how to create a state channel, how to create L0 tokens, how to create some of our other standards that we have coming out as well. So the flight program is awesome. If you want to learn how to, if you want like a boot camp on creating cryptocurrency, go through fundraising, managing a fundraise in crypto while simultaneously building out a book of business and a crypto line item, like it, it's a pretty incredible program and it's going to evolve as we're going to include more legal structure in there to get people moving faster. And I think beyond that, like you're going to start to see a lot more education coming out. So a lot of the goals that the company have been to f- focus on more top of the funnel. How do we educate people on what we're doing, make it easier to understand versus coming in and being like, you're a infrastructure layer, the L01, I don't know. So we want to make it <laughs> You got to make it easy, right? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. So we got the fight program. Like I said, if you're not involved with Lattice, Lattice to me is the marketplace that will exist It is the Lattice Gateway. It's the marketplace that will allow people to access all the projects that are coming into our ecosystem, projects that aren't in our ecosystem, but are contributing value, economic value, liquidity. You can participate in governance and get rewarded for it. And I think the cool thing that one of our ethos is abundance at Constellation. I would say that's one of the first things. And so we did a lot of work behind the scenes and advisory and incubation services that we're going to start to share some of the token grants that we've received from incubating some of these projects and be able to give them out in a meaningful way to our community, to VELTX holders. So it's exciting for me to see that kind of buy-in that we have and the loyalty we have in our community. And I guess my, my one more thing is I really challenge people to take a moment and see the pieces and building blocks that we're putting together. This like whole journey is not just about one piece of technology It's about enabling and empowering businesses and individuals to use technology, but also create a livelihood and connect to a community um, in a really meaningful way. And I know that sounds like a bunch of BS. I think there's more than just, when is this feature going to be done at Constellation? But see how all the pieces are coming together and how that attracts new use cases, projects, the ethos of entrepreneurs. I'm always blown away by the flight program participants, like their heart and soul is in there. I wish I could fund them all. Yeah. But liquidity takes too long, so I can't fund you all. But uh, it's, yeah, it's a pretty big process. And for people, like lean into some of the nuances of crypto. Don't just buy on an exchange and wait for it to go up. See how your impact matters. See yep. the different levers and tools that are out there. We're trying to make it super easy for people where, you know, traditional DeFi out there, uh, is it's complicated. The stuff that's going on out there is really complicated. We're trying to make it super easy. Use it as like a stepping stone, an introductory to this while also seeing kind of the fruits of what we've done behind the, the scene. No, I completely agree with you. It all starts with everybody listening today, right? We have to come together as a community and as a group and really start educating the people around us because the sooner we can educate the people around us, the closer we are going to be to mass adoption. And that's when we, everybody in the world will benefit. What is it? A level playing field that Ripple always talks about. Ben Jorgensen, man, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for just telling us a little bit about you and your background, your life, and educating us on what's going on with Constellation Network. We hope to have you back here whenever you find another hour of, of time. And Will, thank you so much for helping us out with uh, the questions. And just have a great day, man. And keep building. You are a true visionary and a legend in the space and everybody is behind you. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you guys. This was awesome. Great questions. It was fun to make this personable and kind of show how everything really is connected. 
right? Yep. We're not just hired mercenaries to build this shit. We're people too, man. We're people. Yeah. We've got passion. And, and I think it's like an amazing time to jump on to our story and kind of spread the word. I can't thank you guys enough for letting me just like blab about my former life, but hopefully it connected some dots. It's an honor. And I do think this will help future people that are thinking about trying to make a change in the world. This is going to help them, right? Knowing that you can fail or you can run into obstacles, but pushing forward and working on yourself, your mental health, your mental, your health workout, and really get everything in place and then go out and try to really make a change. And thank you for sharing all that with us. Yeah. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. And thanks to everybody that showed up today. You guys have a great day. Fantastic. Have Have a good weekend. Cheers.